Emeritus Professor Mohan De Silva, members of the academic staff, and my dear students, the new entrants of the Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri Javadanpura. It is my pleasant task to introduce to you the speaker for this year's commencement lecture, who is none other than Emeritus Professor Mohan De Silva. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation to this important event of our academic calendar. Professor De Silva, who received his secondary and tertiary education at St. Thomas's Gurutalava and Northern College, Colombo, graduated with honors from the University of Colombo and obtained the postgraduate degrees in surgery from the Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh and the Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, University of Colombo. He joined the Department of Surgery of this faculty as a senior lecturer in 1996 and single handedly developed the surgery curriculum, units at Colombo South Teaching Hospital and the department at the Faculty of Medical Sciences, University of Sri He was later the chair professor of surgery. Professor DC is a multi talented individual, excelling in cricket, where he represented the school, the faculty, and also captained the University of Colombo at the then premier Sarah Trophy tournament. He's also a talented singer, performing in all the talent shows of the art circle of this faculty until his retirement. As a surgeon, he's still much sought after not only for his excellent surgical skills, but for his human qualities towards the patients. He was elected the Dean of our faculty in January 2011 and continued till December 2014, and thereafter was appointed as chairman of the University Grants Commission until his retirement. As the Dean, he was instrumental in securing the land in which we are in now and the funds to build this beautiful building complex the phase four development project of the faculty. He's also the author of a book, textbook on surgery, which is very popular among both undergraduates and postgraduates and authored a chapter in the most renowned surgical textbook of all time, the Bailey and Love's textbook of surgery. He was also one of the most sought after teachers among undergraduates and postgraduates. Now I have covered many aspects of Professor De Silva, but they were not the compelling reasons for us to select him to speak to you all today. Those reasons are his qualities as an individual, a teacher, a surgeon, and an administrator who was a role model to most of us and definitely to me. His honesty and dedication to work, commitment, and empathy are incomparable. These are the qualities which we should all try to inculcate, and these are the qualities that took Professor Mohan De Silva to great heights. But most importantly, I would say, kept him happy and contented at all times. He was always punctual, loved whatever, and did not look a bit tired. I can remember innumerable locations when, he, when I have disturbed him in the middle of the night to get advice on patients I was managing. And he would be ever ready to come and help and would do so with no hesitation. While having a young family of three daughters, during the height of the civil war, he would volunteer to fly to Palali in Jaffna with his wife, who was an anesthetist, leaving behind three kids to operate on the injured continuously for days. Even when he was the dean, he used to walk into the dissection halls to teach first year students, which was not his duty, and never missed a ward teaching at the hospital. Sir, it gives me great pleasure to invite an individual like you who walked the talk to address his eager new entrance to our faculty by delivering the commencement lecture 2021. Thank you. Very good morning to all of you. At the outset, may I thank my colleague, Dr. Jalabhapathirana, the Dean of the Faculty, for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to come back. So when Dr. Jalabhapathirana invited me to speak to you today, I actually went back in my memory lane and was trying to recollect what my mind was look, mind was like on that particular day, long time ago. Of course, like most of you, I was very excited because it was a very unique day in my life. I was very happy with my achievement. I, like any other young man of my vintage, had many ambitions like today. All of you have the same. To be a medical student in the oldest medical faculty then, that was University of Columbia at the time. Now, of course, we have 10 medical faculties. To be a surgeon 
So that was my ambition from my GC O-level times up to this day. It was a long and tedious journey. Was it worth it? Of course it was. Why do I say that? <clears throat> it is not only because I learned, I became wealthy enough to live a decent life and successful in the eyes of my parents. But thinking back, the main reason was that this journey has taught me the art of healing, the art to help people, how to make them happy, how to get them out of near-death situations when operating in the war fields, when they tend to critically injured or critically ill in the hospital settings, attending to critically injured and critically ill at night, and seeing their difficult journeys saddled with complications, attending to them, witnessing their sufferings in intensive care unit settings, being with them, making decisions with regards to their lives, giving them that strength to live. Then in the wards, and on that particular day, when they go home, as it's a happy family with children, I can again tell you that is such a fascinating feeling. The feeling of self-empowerment and innate happiness. No other profession in the world can enjoy that feeling, and you will. Therefore, you have selected the best profession in the world. As an emeritus professor, I'm still a university teacher. As a medical teacher, I enjoy giving knowledge. I love to see my students using this knowledge in their day-to-day -day work. First, of course, to be successful in their exams and then to heal sick. As a teacher, just giving mere recall knowledge will not help them. As medical teachers, we must be able to give you that knowledge in a user-friendly and in a easily extractable package so that students could be able to apply that knowledge to given clinical situations, be it a clinical situation to heal sick or also Equally importantly, in non-clinical settings, to apply the so-called soft skills, which you will learn from us. I firmly believe that these two types of skills, the academic skills and the soft skills, must go hand in hand. To produce a doctor who is a society out there is wanting to have. A doctor who is competent in knowledge and skills, compassionate in his attitude, and of course, with the right mindset. The technique of transmitting knowledge to a student in a format that the student can extract easily later to be able to apply to a given situation, be it a clinical or non-clinical, is a challenging task for medical teachers. In medical education, we often use the patient-based teaching to achieve this task. Of course, this is your first day of the academic calendar of this faculty. And it makes my task harder because you have no medical knowledge. But that doesn't matter to me. Because in this commencement lecture, I'm not going to teach you medicine. I've, had, I've heard many commencement lectures. But to be honest with you, I cannot remember any of them. Or what they were about. So I thought to myself, should I give you this young and intelligent minds a kind of take-home message which may be useful to mold your career? So I shall now commence. And this is what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you a story. Well, it's a moving story, a story of a real patient. But the main character of this story, the patient, is also a surgeon. He was a patient. His name is Dr. Richard Teo. He was a Singaporean surgeon. So this, in fact, is patient-based teaching. Before his death, on the 18th of October, 
2012, Dr. Theo was requested to deliver a lecture to passing out students at Dental Christian Fellowship Meeting in Singapore. The title of his speech was Thoughts of Life, Wealth, Success, and Happiness. I'll repeat the title again, it's very important. Title of his speech was Thoughts of Life, Wealth, Success, and Happiness. I see a story within this story to make you good doctors. Richard Chiu has said that he too wishes to share these thoughts with all of us so we can actually quote him. Before that, I will just introduce him to you. He was a classic model of an aspiring medical student like you. Very active personality, a remarkable all-rounder, excellent both in sports and studies, and a man with great leadership skills, and someone who was matured beyond his years. He was a millionaire, a cosmetic surgeon, and he was 40 years old when he died. Now I will read this deeply inspiring speech by a doctor looking right to the face of death, sharing his thoughts of life, wealth, success, and happiness. The message he gives is simple, very simple, but powerful. Now I have to remind you right at the beginning that this is not my speech. This is a speech of Dr. Richard Chiu. So don't forget that when I start reading what he has written. I quote, Hi, good morning to all of you. I'm reading his speech. My voice is a bit hoarse, so please bear with me. I thought I'll just introduce myself. My name is Richard Chiu. I'm a medical doctor. Since young, <clears throat> I was a typical product of today's society, relatively successful product that society requires. I came from a below average family. I was told by people around me that happiness is about success and the success is about being wealthy. With this mindset, I was all, I've always been very competitive since I was young. Not only I need to go to the top medical school and the top school, I need to have success in all, all my fields. I needed to get trophies. I needed to have colors, awards and everything. So I was highly competitive since young. I went to the medical school and graduated as a doctor. Some of you might know that Within the medical faculty, of course, this was sometime here, some years ago. Ophthalmology is one of the most highly sought after specialties. So I went after that as well because I've been told that that is a difficult one. I was given a traineeship in ophthalmology. I was also given a research scholarship by National University of Singapore to develop lasers to treat eye. So in this process, I got two patents one for medical devices and another for lasers. And you know what? All these academic achievements did not bring me any wealth. So once I completed my bond with National University of the Minister of Health Singapore, I decided that this is taking too long. This training in eye surgery is just taking too long. And there's lots of money to be made out there in the private sector. If you're aware, in the last few years, there is rising cosmetic surgery. Tons of money to be made there. So I decided, well, it is a time to leave. So I quit my training halfway and I went to set up my own aesthetic, that is a cosmetic surgery clinic in the town, together with a day surgery center. You know, the irony is that people do not make heroes out of average doctors. They make heroes out of people who are rich and famous. People who are not happy to pay $20 to see a general practitioner, 
The same person have no problem in paying tens and thousands of dollars for liposuction, that is to remove fat from your tummy to make you look nice. Or $15,000 for a breast augmentation, you know, breast reconstruction, we call it, and so on and so forth. So why do you want to become a general practitioner? Become a cosmetic surgeon. So instead of healing the sick and ill, I decided I will become a glorified beautician. So business was good. In fact, very good. Started off with a patient waiting list of one week. Then it became three weeks, then one month, then two months, and then three months. Waiting list. All in the private sector. I was overwhelmed. There was just too many patients. I employed one doctor, then the second doctor, then the third doctor, and then the fourth doctor. And within one year, we were earning already in millions, just the first year. But never is enough, because I was so obsessed with it. I started to expand into Indonesia to get all the rich Indonesians who wouldn't blink an eye to have a procedure done. So life was really good. So what do I do with this spare cash? How do I spend my weekends? Typically, I will have car club gatherings. With spare cash, I got myself a racing car. We all go to saving in Malaysia. That's where the racing track is. We go for car racing. And it was my life. With this other spare cash, what do I do? So I got myself a Ferrari. At the time, 458 isn't it out, isn't out. It's just a spider convertible 430. There was this friend of mine, a schoolmate, who became a trader and a rich bank. So he got a red one and I got a silver. So why do I what what I what do I do after getting the car? Well, it's time to buy a house or to build our own bungalows. So we went around looking for the land to build our own bungalows. So we went around hunting. So how do I live my life? Well, we all think we have to mix around with rich and famous like Miss Universe, you know, that type of thing. So we hang around with the most beautiful, rich and famous. So this is how we spend our lives with dining and all these restaurants, you know. So I reach a point in life that I got everything in my life. Now I have to remind you that it's not my life. I'm talking about Richard Thiel. So I reach a point in life that I got everything in my life. I was at the pinnacle of my career and all. I thought I was like having everything under control and reaching the pinnacle. Well, it was wrong. I didn't have everything under control. About last year, March, I started to develop a backache. That's a pain in the back in the middle of nowhere. Well, I thought it may be just because of this heavy exercise. I was an exercise fanatic as well. So I went to Singapore General Hospital. I saw my classmate who's a radiologist and got an MRI done, just in case. It's not a slip disc or something like that. And that evening, he called me and said that he found some bone marrow replacement in my spine. I said, sorry, what does that mean? I know, I mean, I know what it means, but I couldn't accept it. I was like, are you serious? I was still running around in my gym, you know. But we had more scans the next day, the PET scans, that is positron emission, emission scans, which you can actually see the, uh, you know, high vascular cancer type of areas. In fact, they found that actually I have stage four terminal lung cancer. It has already spread to my brain, the spine, that was a cause for back pain the liver, and to my adrenal glands. And you know, one moment I was there, totally thinking that I had everything under control, thinking that I have reached the pinnacle of my life. But the next moment, I have just lost it. I was told that even with chemotherapy, that I will have about three or four months to live. That's the most. Did my life come crashing on? Of course it did. 
who wouldn't? I went into depression. Of course, severe depression. Because I thought previously I had everything under control. See, the irony is that all these things we have, the success, the trophies, the cars and house and all, I thought they brought me happiness. But I was feeling really down. I've been severe depression. Having all these thoughts of my positions, they brought me, they brought me no joy. The thought of, you know, I can have my Ferrari to sleep. No, it's not going to happen. It brought no single comfort during my last 10 months. And I thought they were, but they were not true happiness. What really brought my joy in the last 10 months was interaction with people, my loved ones, my friends, the people who genuinely care about me. They, they laugh, they cry with me, and they are able to identify the pain and suffering I was going through. That brought joy to me. That brought me happiness. None of the other things. I have all these possessions. And I thought they were supposed to bring me happiness. But it didn't. Because if it did, I would have not, I would, I would have felt happy thinking about it when I was feeling really down. It didn't happen then. Those were what we call objects of envy. I have them. I show them off to others. And I feel that by showing them, it can fill my own pride and ego. But that didn't bring any joy to them. But I thought they were a real joy to me and to them as well. Well, let me just share another little story with you. You know, when I was about your age, I stayed in King Edward VII Hall. I had this friend, a girlfriend, whom I thought was rather strange. Her name is Jennifer. We are still good friends. And as I walk along the path, she would, if she sees a snail, she would actually pick up the snail and put it along the grass patch. I was like, why do you need to do that? Why dirty your hands? It is just a snail. The truth is that she could feel for the snail. The thought of being crushed to death is real to her. But for me, it was just a snail. There I was being trained as a doctor to be compassionate, to be able to emphasize, but I couldn't. As a house officer in the oncology department at the National University of Singapore, oncology is a cancer department, every day or every other day, I witnessed death in the cancer department. I saw how they suffered. I saw all the pain they went through. I saw all the morphine they have to press every minute just to relieve their pain. I saw them struggling with their oxygen, breathing their last breath and all. But it was just a job. But was the patient real to me? They weren't real to me. It was just a job. I do it. I get out of the world. I can't wait to go home to do my own stuff. But if you ask me now, would I have become being a very different doctor if I were to relive my life today? I can tell you that yes, I will. Because I truly understand how the patients feel now. And sometimes you have to learn in the hard way. Inevitably, all of you who are here will start to go into private practice at some stage. You will start to accumulate wealth. And actually, there is nothing wrong with being successful, with being rich or wealthy. Absolutely nothing wrong. The only trouble is that a lot of us, like myself, couldn't handle it. Why do I say that? Because when I start to accumulate, the more I have, the more I want. The more I wanted, the more obsessed I became. Like what I showed you earlier on, all I can was basically get more positions to read the pinnacle of what society did to us of what society want us to be. I became so obsessed that nothing else really mattered to me. Patients are just a source of income. 
and I try to squeeze every single cent out of these patients. A lot of times we forget whom we are supposed to be serving. We become so lost that we serve nobody else but just ourselves. That was what happened to me. My challenge to you is not to lose that moral compass. I learned it in the hard way. I hope you don't ever have to do it. We have been trained to be healthcare professionals, providers, and all and yet, we don't know how exactly they, our clients, the patients feel. I'm not asking you to get involved emotionally. I don't think it is proficient. But do we actually make a real effort to understand their pain and all? Most of us won't. And I can assure you. So don't lose it. My challenge to you is to always be able to put yourself in your patient's shoes because the pain, anxiety, and the fear are very real to them, even though it may not be real to you. You guys have a bright future ahead of you with all the resources and energy. So do think about it. Even as you go on to become professionals, that you can reach out to these people who are in need. Whatever you do can make a large difference to them. I'm now at the receiving end. So I know how it feels to have someone who genuinely care for you, encourage you and all. It makes a lot of difference to me today. When I face death, when I had to, I strip myself of all stuff totally. And I focus only on what is essential. The irony is that a lot of times, only when we learn how to die, then we start thinking how we should have lived. I know it sounds very morbid this morning to all of you, but it is the truth. And that is what I am going through. Don't let society tell you how to live. Those things happen to me. And I led this life thinking that these are going to bring me happiness. I hope that you will think about it and decide for yourself how you want to live your own life. Because true happiness doesn't come from serving yourself. I thought it was, but it didn't turn out to be that way. I unquote. That is the story of Richard Teo. As I told you, I saw a story within this story, I'm sure, and I sincerely hope that you too saw the story within this true story. The essence of the story of Richard Teo is around life, success, wealth, and happiness. And that life is too short to neglect the real sources of happiness. But unfortunately, most of the time, our ears and the eyes are completely closed to this simple truth until we face death ourselves. Let's critically look at these terms, the success, wealth, and happiness that Dr. Teo mentioned. What is wealth? Well, for, for many, to have wealth means have money and assets. It's also referred to as material wealth. Although money is necessary for comfortable living, many wrongly believe that money is all you need to have a fulfilling life. There are other more important things that provide happiness that don't necessarily have a monetary value. The valuable personal assets you acquire, your knowledge, your skills or talent, relationships with your family, with your friends and with your colleagues, your health, your selfless service to others to make them happy, your character, your values constitute the greatest wealth, sometimes referred to as a real wealth. What is happiness? And is there a link between the wealth and the happiness? Well, in my opinion, happiness you are looking for is inside you. Happiness is experience of joy, containment within us, 
combined with a sense that one's life is good, meaningful, and worthwhile. Among the vital ingredients of happy life are our unique skills and our abilities to enrich our lives and benefit lives of others, developing and maintaining a quality social relationships, positive thinking, compassion, but most importantly, caring for others as a medical person. There is no direct link between wealth and happiness. There is only a perceived connection. You perceive, but there is no direct link. So what is success? Success is not a destination, but a journey of milestones and achievements. It never ends. The doing is more important than the outcomes. It is about what you learn along the way. And one needs more than ambitions and talents to make success of anything. There must also be passion and conviction of whatever you do. Success and the happiness are inextractably, inextractably linked. Happiness can create success, but success is not the key to happiness. At this stage of your lives, you all have brilliant and unspoiled minds. And you are entering this profession today and about to begin an incredible journey that will not only change your life, but the lives of thousands and millions of others. You will use a rich array of activities and the opportunities provided by the Faculty of Medical Sciences of our university to learn, grow, and embrace a balance between the academic and professional excellence and pursuit of diverse cultural and social activities. I'm certain that you will live here armed with knowledge, skills, but most importantly, set up good values as a good doctor and with a level of professionalism and commitment to make a difference in yourself and to others. And I sincerely hope that one day, in years to come, you shall be able to return to the same hall here and tell your students that you have lived as a medical professional with a clear conscience. Now again, most sincerely thank my colleague, your respected Dean Professor, Dean Professor Alupapathirna, and all my colleagues present here in the faculty for giving me this unique opportunity to take one class in my own faculty. I also sincerely wish that all, all of you will find real happiness, understand the beauty of self-empowerment, and will have the strength and courage to reach the pinnacle in your chosen fields of interest. Thank you.